I remember the painting, The Battle of Waterloo, which hung in my grandfather's drawing room towards the end of the year, 1929. I was past eight years old then. My grandfather was close to 80. It happened when the dying governor of the colony rode past along East Street. The ghost of a commander in chief, thin as a reed, wearing a glint of glasses like the sun on the canal. My grandfather's tenant occupied a tenement ridge in Waterloo Street a couple of blocks away from E Street, which I was taken to visit for the first time the day after the governor rode past. We arrived at the entrance to the property and turned into the brooding alleyway running between the two faces of long squat buildings one reflecting the iron logic of philanthropy, the other, meekly bent to the slow, unrepentant dream of recovering the coin of profit. I became aware of a living freeze of subjective figures occupying the frame of each doorway in which a group stood or sat with the hollow darkness of their room at their back. It was Saturday afternoon and everyone seemed possessed of the dreadful ease of an unkempt battalion whose economic gratitude and morale were alternatively aroused and shaken as their old landlord paused to address them. The fact was, this fortnightly visit of his, though I did not immediately realize it, was a pure ritual, since no one with the exception of one family of symbolic tenants, the Antrops, were able to pay a penny of his rent. A slump existed everywhere. A severe retrenchment of investment in the raw materials of business and the minimum portion of work which could be scraped together within the granite circumstance of the pool went to keep the link on harsh body and charitable soul together. Nearly all the tenants were six months at least in debt and some had not paid for over a year. And all they could do was continue to plead to be allowed to occupy the rooms at the back into which I now peered, drawn in spite of myself with the necessity of contemplating a love of horror as if I glimpsed the subterranean anatomy of revolution. In my father's house are many mansions and underworld as well, within which might still be bred progenies of change out of the seeming absurdity and perversity of a corner of affection. 
The old man had no intention of putting them out. When he saw she could not pay anything at the moment. Unless one knew how to draw blood from stone. But equally, he did not intend to relinquish his professional vocation like a doctor confronting his patient, a commander, his troop, to remind them sooner or later the depth of living duty and community must be paid. And say was Antrop. After all, the head of one family, who miraculously, it seemed, overcame circumstance and settled with him on each occasion he visited. The family of Antrop occupied the last couple of rooms in the range. And Antrop himself appeared at the door wreathed in smiles, full of that unwilling gaiety one associates with an unnatural spirit of the poor. He closed the door quickly behind him to conceal the inmates I had seen. Half naked woman his wife, with twins at her breast. One thirty-two Carmichael Street. To celebrate my eighty-eighth birthday, I felt it to be good to share this history of the tenement yard, a cooperative environment that contributed much my formative and subsequent years. 132 Carmichael Street was the location of a tenement yard on the eastern side of the street, one lot away from Church Street on the south. I was born in the Georgetown Public Hospital to the sound of the six o'clock cannon in Kingston. The cannon located in the Kingston Ward took the place of an alarm clock for the working class, signifying that it was time to drink tea, that is, bush tea with bread or Wheaton and Richter Edgeboy biscuits. I lived there with my parents, John and Priscilla, from the age three and a half, reaching 17 in 1951, when we left the yard. The yard occupied a long rectangular space. The landlord, Mr. Ranking, and his family of East Indian descent occupied big, the big house in the front. The style was vernacular, commonplace, featuring a wooden two-storied building with demerara windows, wooden jealousies, and fretwork eaves. Being perched on tall brick columns provided a high bottom house where the open space between the front columns had lattice work. Inhabiting a small room in the bottom house was Mr. Daly, the yard man. He resembled Jack Johnson in the photograph my dad had framed. Having a loud, rough voice made him a dreaded figure observed by children from a distance. At the front of the garden was a red hibiscus hedge with two white oleander shrubs, both sides of the main gate. Some of the Y-shaped branches of the oleander were cut by boys without permission because they provided perfect forms for our slingshots. Flower beds of marigolds were surrounded by ceramic bottles that held the stout imported from England. The tenement yard's single entrance on Carmichael Street led to a narrow passage bordered by the landlord's wire garden fence on the left. 
On the other side were the backs of houses and zinc fences of the neighboring yards. During rainy season, boards were laid on the walk because the passage became white and muddy. For boys, this became a sporting adventure. We walked heavily on some boards, which created spurts of muddy water for us to dodge. This, of course, created cavities under the boards, which created problems for unsuspecting adults. Another hazard faced when using the tenement entrance was the equivalent of running the gauntlet, a very ripe, soft breadfruit the side of a cannonball falling from an overhanging breadfruit tree. It had the potential to be funny if you were an observer or a real nuisance if directly affected. Survival took the form of listening for the sudden rustling of the large breadfruit leaves and running like mad. The tenement yard itself consisted of range houses, usually two or four to a range. Rooms were all about the same size, roughly 15 by 15 feet. Occupants of rooms were mainly common-in-law couples, a few with children. The yard itself was like a village, meaning that privacy was at the premium. On the other hand, help was extended to single individuals who became bedridden due to illness like flu or malaria. Children belonged to the yard and could be disciplined verbally by anyone, especially Miss Alda, the matriarch of the yard. She was a tall red woman, past middle age, who wore long, plain earth colored skirts with a white long sleeve blouse, soft canvas shoes, known commonly as yachting shoes, and rolled down socks. Her ensemble was completed by a white head tie topped with a wide brimmed Panama hat. As she strode through the yard, her eyes took in everything and she would intervene if any altercation, quite rare, ever arose. She was respected by adults, feared by noisy children. Boys and girls bathed under the two standpipes in the yard until Miss Alda announced to their respective parents that it was time girls used the communal bath. Before a shower was installed, a bucket of water had to be fetched. Boys use red life boy soap. Girls use white lux or pale green palm olive. The big yard had one large vat and the tenement yard had two, which were connected by zinc pipes to roofs to collect rainwater for cooking and drinking. Water from the standpipes came the, from the shelter belt plant on Vilsingen Road at the head of Church Street. The plant was connected to the Lamahawk Conservancy, which supplied tea colored water. The government then set up a purification system to provide potable and drinkable water much lighter in color. My mom, however, in the evening, used to sift a film of flour over the top of the water in a bucket and cover it. Next morning, the water was crystal clear and used for cooking and making tea. The flour had settled, taking microscopic particles with it. Her technique using flour as a flocculant was correct. Years later, I learned the shelter belt used powdered alum to do the same thing. Tenants now had potable water, but most still preferred drinking rainwater stored in the vats. Use of the water from this source was controlled by having taps, which were padlocked. If the water was too low, the wood would shrink and exposed wood could even become dry rot. During the rainy season, a mosquito control officer in his khaki uniform and broad brim felt hat of the same color inspected the vats to prompt a little ceremony, which 
fascinated me. He climbed a short ladder, removed a small sieve on the vat cover that kept leaves and other debris out. Using a long flashlight, he would peer into the depths of the water. From a small bucket, he would scoop up small fish known as millions and release them in the water. I did not know why, but later learned that the fish ate malaria larva to control the spread of malaria. Shared facilities were two communal kitchens at the front and the back section of the yard. Cooking pots and coal pots used for burning either wood or charcoal were made from cast iron and imported from the UK. There were two East Indian families who cooked on firesides created from clay mixed with, with dried cow dung to give it strength. Large forms to hold two pots incorporated two metal rods. They did not lose heat by radiation like cast iron pots and reduced cooking time. My mom eventually asked the Muhammad family to make one for her to use in the cooking shed dad had constructed. As a fire chief for the family, I found it easier to light and maintain the flame. The fireside itself was renovated by daubing, wiping fresh clay over it. Our metal cast iron coal pot was reserved for heating clothes irons. The communal kitchens also provided a medical service. Smoke blackened the cobwebs were used by us boys to stem blood from cuts in our feet, which were the result sometimes from playing in grass along the Carmichael Street Avenue, which could contain pieces of grass bottles, as we call them. Thinking of it now, the use of spider webs as an antiseptic could be an interesting research project in medicine. The other facility shared was a toilet and bathroom at the bottom of the yard. A bucket of water and a calabash for dipping were used for bathing until a shower was installed. The door was usually kept closed to prevent rent-free occupation by frogs and toads. Your towel and clothes hung over the door indicated it was being used. On Sundays, Mr. Rankin received rent from the inhabitants of the yard. I was tasked with delivering $3 in an envelope to John, his son, and on rare occasions to Mr. Rankin himself, seated in his rocking chair. The Muhammad family, which occupied one of the northern rooms, were close friends with mine. Little Rihanna, in particular, was so close to my mom that her mom, Bibi, used to say, Miss Lydia, you are that girl's mother, not me. In Guyanese parlance, she spirit must be tech to you. Some kind of spiritual attraction, indeed, must have existed between the two. I like to encourage Rihanna to say cucumber, which came out as cucumbumba, which made me laugh. I was told by my mom to stop making fun of her. Mr. Muhammad owned a dray cart, which he sometimes stabled in the big yard. In the afternoon, he parched peanuts to sell outside after cinema. Loose nuts he sometimes gave to my mom, who made nut cakes loved by all who received them. Mr. Cummings, his old aunt, and Agnes, his young female cousin, occupied the room adjacent to the Mohammeds. Agnes became my big sister. I was surprised and most distraught when Agnes died. But got over it when Calvin Stephen, another cousin, joined the family. We became close friends and playmates. Mr. Cummings was the only person in the yard, apart from the rankings, to own a radio. On Sundays, it was turned up loud so others could share the broadcast of Sunday services. It was a classical music program produced by Rafi Khan, which really held my attention. 
On one such occasion, when I was 15, I heard Andre Segovia play Recuerdos de Alhambra, which sounded like a mandolin guitar duet. After hearing the announcement at the end, investigating how to play classical guitar became an enterprise that still exists. My family occupied one of the rooms on the southern part of the Western Range. My dad tried his best to make us comfortable by doing a range of odd jobs, tree trimming, sign painting, tattooing, room mending, other than working on the waterfront as a general labor. Our first next door neighbor was Mr. Barrow from Barbados. On, on weekends, he would lock himself in with a bottle of rum. A little later would come songs whose mumbled words in a Bajan accent made them unintelligible to me. He was followed by a Mr. Gerard family with two children. His wife was an East Indian from West Coast Village who had run away with him. Mr. Gerard was a short man with muscle in arms and torso so defined you could follow each strand. Such definition would have put muscle builders to shame. From his conversations, I learned he used to be a pork knocker, having to paddle boats upriver for days or even weeks on end in order to reach the gold fields. Mr. Gerard was a devoted family man who also had a strong sense of community. Being aware of the muddy condition of the passage during the rainy weather, he collected funds from tenants, obtained spilled cement from his workplace. With the assistance of others, the passageway was paved and extended to the communal toilets at the back of the yard. Mr. Gerard loved cricket and built a bench near to his home to engage cricket loving individuals in conversations, especially during test matches. The Northern Range ran from east to west. The top room was occupied by Miss Alda. The next family was Miss East Indian with a daughter. Buddy was the father who had had an unusual habit of brushing his teeth in public. His wife's name, Mashum, had a kind of magic to it. I felt it sounded like something from the Arabian Nights. The next room was occupied by Alfred Ferdinand, a young bachelor who worked on the waterfront. He had a fine physique and boxed professionally as a middleweight. He was considered to be an upcoming champion, according to newspaper reports. I would read about fights, look at photographs, and wondered what it would be like to attend matches to see him in action. Ferdinand always stopped by to say something to me whenever he passed by, and I began to regard him as a big brother. I was most distressed to learn that during his last bout, he had slipped in the ring, hit his head hard on the canvas-covered wooden floor, and later died in the hospital. My distress was further heightened by the memory of the earlier demise of my big sister, Agnes. The last room was on the range was used by a gentleman. I use the term bec because unlike others, he was dressed not like a laborer. On returning home, he would lock his bicycle in his room. I often wondered what he did for a living. One day, a policeman came into the yard and headed for his room. The drama began to unfold as they knocked heavily on his door. We knew he was inside and waited to see what would happen when he opened the door. It remained closed, so they broke it open. The man was nowhere to be seen. The reason was that he had made a trap door in the floor. The space under the range houses was quite close, but maneuverable. As boys, we often had to retrieve balls and even look for eggs laid by hands that had strayed. After the war, the big house remained empty for a while until it was rented by Richard Ishmael to establish the Indian Education Trust, a secondary school. Finally, the yard was where I learned early on to make things from observing my dad and to draw as well. 
which led to my total involvement with the visual arts, apart from a professional career in education. But that is a much longer story. Many years later, 132 Camacho Street was acquired by the government. All the tenement buildings were dismantled and the big house was rebuilt and extended to become the Ptolemy Reed Rehabilitation Center named after the Minister of Health in the Burnham administration. Seeing this for the first time and thinking of the compatibility that existed among former tenants, I uttered a silent prayer for the well-being of patients as well as the administrative staff. This is for the few of you who can appreciate the benefits of not starting life with a silver spoon, but endured an enamel plate and cup, or even a calabash gourd. Richard Alsop in his Dictionary of Caribbean English Usage describes the tenement yard as a dilapidated looking house of about five or six rooms that must teem with vermin, a family of six or eight probably occupying each room. If people at the standpipe in the tenement yard are cussed and quarrelsome, conditions have made them so. Hell, <laughs> I now understand why it's a ruction. In 1940, my family lived behind the corner parlor in a tenement yard owned by Clyde Duncan's grandmother at the northwestern corner of East and Murray, now Quamina Streets. The entrance to that shop was two bridges that sloped 45 degrees to the road. Ideal runaway for small boys with their scooters and skates and enough mishaps with passing vehicles. What is fun for buy is often debt for crapo. I must have been three years of age as I distinctly remember being assigned to watch my baby sister Bernice, just toddling and barely standing up to reach the 18 inch barrier across the doorway of our one room home, which had two treaders. My mother needed to get some food stuff from the border market two corners away and asked a neighbor, the Thorns, to keep an eye on us. I clearly remember Cokes and Bernice not to cry as mommy will be back home soon. Hell, baby sitting at three? <laughs> no wonder I understand women so well. By 1941, we moved to the tenement yard number two, which was on Regent Road behind the baker shop, five yards east of Cobbins Street, northern side. Next to the baker shop, at the entrance to the tenement yard, was a charcoal wood shop which supplied fuel to the bakery and retail to neighbors. A penny wood was an 18-inch log of wallaba chopped in four quarters, two strokes, and voila, a bundle to fetch under the arms to mother, bawling, hurry up before the light wood chips burn out. The yard was two tenement ranges facing each other, four rooms each, one window each, front and back, for nature's cool air to blow through. Our family of five, parents and three picnies, were moving up in the world, as this tenement had three threaders. The front door was the back door, but hell, I was moving up in the world one treader at a time. Next to the steps was a huge rectangular shingle box, our designer kitchen. It housed a chula, a neat dab mud fireside, and had space for a huge enamel basin that stored our dishes, pots, kahari, roti pan, and enamel utensils for eating. Naturally, in this neighborhood, the basin had to be brought inside the crowded one room each night, or we eat out of air leaf next day. You think it we see? The huge basin was useful to take all the wares for washing to the five foot square standpipe, 
which was a triage of a tenement yard of cosmopolitan souls, cantankerous, boisterous, fast in everybody's business, each determined to be the hell's kitchen big shot hot shot. Tenement yards were lavishly covered with layers of newspapers, cinema pamphlets, and posters evoking promises when moving in to wallpaper next Christmas. One all-purpose four-feet table scrubbed to the bone, and oil cloth also promised for next Christmas. The floor, Dutch clean, scrubbed with Marvex. Lelonium to come next Christmas also. Tenement yard tenants are always so full of hope that Christmas will solve their problems. Cool, refreshing water was stored in the goblet, and at night, the one kerosene lamp was lit for A, B, C, and two plus two arithmetic sums. We were poor. We lived in a nursery rhyme shoe with a Mother Hubbard's cupboard, but we were contented, never hungry. My mother was a domestic engineer and surveyor. She could slice a two cents loaf of bread into four equal parts so fast or last grab always gets the same size of slice. From Maselli, tripe, salt beef, potato, kalaloo and baji plus ground provisions were gourmet meals. Flour was kneaded into a wide variety of roti and bake. My favorite was shrimp bake, conky and pone. And the after school pop or porridge ranged from cornmeal to sago, barley to plantain flour or Quaker oats with North Scar fresh milk. Now and then Kong Pom, Daisy, Red Rose, Green Tea or chocolate. Every range yard had its own nightmare. My Frankenstein in this tenement yard was an ugly, hideous character named Nose Gay. A huge heel gash from across his eye that halved his nostril into a cavernous Quasimodo mouth, which leered and terrified all the kids in the yard. The behind his back nylon was that during an attempted burglary in entry, he put up with a cutlass. He drove a dray cart for a living, so play in this yard and after school was taboo. There was no television, but Friday was payday and prime time. Breadwinners, fathers, husbands, not necessarily the same, came home from work, enumerated after a short stop at the rum shop, and rang and strang beat up the whole household. Others in the yard, on drinking spree and domino matches that ended in loud arguments and furious fistic fights to match Len Houston and D1 Singh at the Olympic cinema. And those hot to trot out for the evening, arguing to go out, and returning late at night, arguing to get in. The ringside view of tournament yard action was exhilarating. Life's lessons learned from a Pandora box of complexities and adversities. Enough obstacles, yet enough opportunities. Tenement Yard No. 3, 1944, a deluxe version at Marion Cummins Street. Wow! The ranges, three compartments connected, were in stilts, seven feet above the ground, one room for each tenant, but a front and back step with running water piped to a small kitchen adjoining each room. Entrances from Cummins and also Murray Street with the Corner Tower Mansion housing a massive Portuguese family. Henry Gomes, chief pressman of the Agassiz with enough nicey picnics. Hell, <laughs> the chins were moving up the steps. We were at least 10 treaders, but was still a tenement yard. A galvanized bathroom stood in the middle of the yard which still left enough yard space to start my ball career of cricket, football, 
marbles, and often rounders to accommodate the girl children. The next year, we moved to the front duplex. Even then, while at Smith's Church Congregational, Hatfield Street, I frequented the large tenement yard at Ben and Loisero behind Braffitt's Drug Store to play endless windpuss football and cowboy and Indians with schoolmates Winston Bruce, Raphael Blue, and the Haynes brothers. In my early teens, my passion was the sound of the steel pans. But all the top local steel bands came out of tenement yards. So, every spare moment not playing ball, I spent at Rob and Orange Walk where Pemi lived and Covadis and Maribonta spawned. Straight also into Invaders Federation Yard at Ridington Welton Street where Dan Sandiford lived and gallivanted into the tenement yard on Brother Street behind the Edgar Boy Biscuit Factory opposite James Vulcanizing Shop. This yard also had stables, an ironmonger and a blacksmith, and a young Roy Gettys, which future pan stars beating pan. Man, even these, these tenants of the tenement yards were still waiting for Christmas, when the steel bands were permitted to tramp on the road and collect tin cup offerings from enthusiastic roadside supporters. You can take me out of the tenement yard, but you can't take the tenement yard out of me. Friendships from the tenement yards live on forever, despite the pain, the nightmares, the brothers, the tension, the struggle, the clashes, the cussouts. Every day was push come to shove, scratching for a make do existence. This humble existence ignited ambition, the goal that our offspring would be better off, and they were. The sacrifices to make ends meet, buying two cigarettes and an ounce of coffee at a time, begging for trust, living day to day on a wing and a prayer, added to the grandeur of life most worthwhile. Thank you.